Welcome back to Demystifying 5G. Welcome back to our special edition on OTA, over the air uh, testing methodologies. We're discussing that again with Benoit Dera, our uh, R&D director for OTA and Antenna Test Solutions. Hello, Andreas. Hello, everyone. Okay, so the last time we actually talked about uh, the measurement distance, uh, talked about the Fraunhofer uh, distance and how that can be significantly reduced if you're only interested in uh, directivity measurements on the peak of the beam. Um, so Bina was so great and explained to us like how our measurement system could look like, how our software-based approach uh, could look like. In that sense, I had a few more questions. We talked about the, the posi positioning system in such a measurement system. How important is the positioning system? Well, it's, it's really crucial, uh, Andreas. Uh, definitely, especially now that we are moving towards millimeter wave technologies, um, as the wavelength is so short, a small error in your positioning could actually result in important phase deviations, for example. And if you feed that into a near-field, far-field transform, then that would uh, eventually create some large errors. Now you see, with these positioning systems, we are moving that kind of antennas. This is one antenna that we use in our millimeter wave testing systems. So it's interesting, in other systems I see typically horn antennas being used to create these directivity. So that is obviously not a horn antenna. So why we decided for this type of antenna and what it is exactly? Yeah, it's a dual polarized Vivaldi antenna. So it's, it's actually made of two Vivaldi antennas. Big advantage is it's broadband, so it covers the whole 5G millimeter wave range uh, from 12 to 90 gigahertz with uh, directivity or again higher than 10 dBi and a cross polarization rejection of more than 20 dB. So clearly it's really the type of antenna you need for doing all types of OTA measurements across the complete millimeter wave range. Um, so positioning these antennas you to actually go over a sphere around your DUT you really need to make sure you are doing a very careful positioning because otherwise if you deviate from the position you think and you fit this into uh, your near field to far field algorithm for example then deviations will actually pile up and create some large errors. So yes we have positioners like in the ATS 1000 that you are seeing which uh, enable better than 0.1 degree accuracy in positioning. Okay that's, that's, that's a very crucial point. Uh, talking about these uh, exact positioning, so that sounds to someone that is not really familiar with the topic that the measurement grid that we're using, the actual measurement points, is a lot, so it's a long test time. How we did overcome this uh, kind of argument about longer test times looking at the measurement grid? Do we do something special in that area? Yeah, we, can, we, we have different kinds of solutions. Uh, one solution, we call it the spiral scanning, for example, where we rotate continuously the elevation arm that supports the antenna and the azimuth table and then actually scan a spiral over the sphere and we can use this either in direct far field measurements or also we have this FIAFTA algorithm again that we can use with irregular set of points and we can fit these points into the near field to far field transforms. Okay, so if I understand correctly, the, the spiral can scan, is that like uh, peeling an orange? Yeah, it looks like that okay. actually in practice. Okay, okay. So um, it sounds all great and we talked a lot about the, the TX side of things, so TX part of the measurements. Um, I assume there's somewhere a bottleneck, right? So we haven't talked really about RX. Is, could that be where we're coming into a couple of challenges with this uh, methodology? Yeah, you're touching the critical point that when you are doing these near field to far field transforms, you need to take a phase reference somewhere. But when you are looking at RX and maybe you have no connector on your device, then how do you pick your phase reference? Also the other point is in RX, you have a mixture of what your receiver actually uh, has in terms of input power and how the actual field, the near field from the antenna, which is now used as TX, to your device on the test couples. And you cannot discriminate so easily what in your results comes from the actual device uh, performance or from the actual uh, field coupling within your near field setup. Okay. So clearly for RX aspects in the near field, we have to use other approaches. Okay, then let's talk about these uh, approaches. So, so far we talked about the software based approach, right? Uh, uh, getting uh, measurements done in the near field and uh, uh, putting these parameters or measurement results into a uh, software transformation algorithm. So uh, I suspect now we're talking about hardware approaches, right? What are the two hardware approaches? Exactly. Yeah, you're right, Andreas. Actually, there are hardware field transformations approach. Also, uh, I would say people in the community would call them indirect far field approaches. Um, 
I can introduce first a very innovative approach that we developed in Rodenschwarz. It's called the PWC200. The plane wave converter? Exactly. And it's been made specifically to address the market of base station testing, uh, massive MIMO base stations, sub 6 gigahertz. And the idea really with this plane wave converter is to use a phased antenna array. And as we know, if we are in the near field, and we discussed in the previous video, uh, that the field from these antennas will actually look like a spherical wavefront, right? But if you actually use many antennas and you combine these fields in a smart way, using different phase shifts, different magnitudes that input each of these antennas in the signals, then you can actually combine these fields to create a plane wave at a very short distance. Okay, but uh, how far is that distance? Well, with the plane wave converter, uh, in this sub-6 gigahertz range, what we achieve is within 1.5 meter, we can generate a quiet zone size of 1 meter spherical, which means that within this 1.5 meter distance only, you actually create a far field condition in this big sphere, which you would normally create maybe within a 20 meter direct far field range. Yeah. So like a far field spatial acceleration. Okay, so you mentioned we uh, use uh, multiple antennas to do that. How many antenna elements we have on that PWC? We have 156 antennas okay. actually to generate that. And behind these antennas, phase shifters, attenuators, which allow to control all the different signal amplitudes and signal phases. Has that been done before by someone in that? There were ideas published around these kind of approaches, but there was never a commercial system out of this. Okay, okay. And the big advantage of this plane wave converter is then that because you are actually in the far field in the end, even though the distance would look like near field, but the, you generate a far field condition, that you can measure all parameters directly like in far field. So no problem with TX, RX, this is reciprocal device, yeah. EVM, ACLR, SEM, all those non-periodic quantities also can be assessed exactly directly like in the far field. And bonus, because you shorten the distance, you also get a better dynamic. Yeah, okay, understood. So a very innovative approach that uh, Roland Schwartz uh, pushes here through the, uh, to the industry. Um, what about uh, uh, other approaches to create a, a quiet zone uh, so that you can uh, do this type of testing and are not dependent on phase retrieval and that? Well, another well-known approach is the so-called Qatar or Compact Antenna Test Range. And we have here an example of what can be put in a Qatar. This is a reflector that we manufacture at Rodinch Farts for uh, actually taking an impinging wave which is spherical and then also transform it into a plane wave. Okay, so that reflector we could install in an ATS-1000 that you showed earlier, which we used for the near-field, far-field uh, transformation methodology as well. Right? Exactly, and we are doing it. We are having our chamber within the ATS-1000, same type of enclosure, uh, this kind of reflector to do the conformance testing for 5G millimeter wave OTA. Okay. Um, what I see here on our reflector compared to others that I've seen in the industry, we have rounded edges. Why we have that and why is that important? Well, it's very crucial because actually one thing that you have with these reflectors is that your size and the scattering of the shape somehow determines the quality and the size of your quiet zone. So if you have very sharp edges, you start to diffract some energy and then this creates some ripple and this also reduces the global size of the quiet zone which means in the end you can test s only smaller devices with the, uh, with the high accuracy. So if you want to avoid these discontinuities, because electromagnetic fields don't like discontinuities, you have to have these very round edges where the currents can flow very smoothly and eventually also scatter the energy in the back part of the, of the reflector, which is not then impacting your DUT. Okay, so you have, a very, uh, you have to have a very sophisticated manufacturing process to, to do all our type of that. Um, I also read about uh, that the surface of the reflector is very important. Can you explain that a little bit? Yes, the surface is extremely important. Somehow the surface accuracy defines how high in frequency you can go before you start to get also ripple in your quiet zone and uh, not so accurate results. So in principle, if you want to test what we can do with this reflector up to frequencies of let's say 90 gigahertz, for example, for touching the harmonics of the uh, 5GNR uh, frequency range 2, then you need to have about 24, 25 microns RMS surface accuracy. 
And with our production process, which is by the way patented, we can achieve that in our factories. So the goal with both hardware-based approaches, and Qatar in particular, is to create a large enough quiet zone. So uh, what, we do, what do we look for from a quiet zone? Dimension, size? Yeah, usually, um, okay, you want to fit your device within the quiet zone and to do this with a compact antenna test range, for example, the rule of thumb is uh, your quiet zone size will be half of the reflector size. So what we do in our solutions is we generate enough uh, quiet zone size to fit in a smartphone, a tablet or a laptop in case of millimeter wave device here we are speaking. So speaking about the, the quiet zone performance, what, what are the typical parameters that I look for uh, to understand and, and judge that better? Yeah, so there are two sets of parameters we usually look at in quiet zone performance. Uh, the first one is the so-called amplitude and phase taper. Taper, okay, can you explain taper a little bit? Yeah, so you understood that uh, in the quiet zone we want to create a plane wave front, right? Yes. But actually our wave deviates from uniform. And there is this slow variation, which is something like a spherical cap, either in phase or in amplitude. Okay. And somehow you characterize this difference you get from the uniform. And this is the taper. Okay. Typically, we're looking at 1 dB taper quiet zone in terms of magnitude and 10 degree taper in terms of phase. Those are typical quantities you see in the field. Okay, so I assume that uh, if you uh, want to create a larger quiet zone, then these values will change. Is that right? Yes, definitely. That, that's clear. If you keep the reflector same size and so on, another parameter which impacts very much the taper is the feed itself. So the amplitude taper of the feed, which would actually change also the, the taper you have in your quiet zone. So and these uh, uh, values also would have an impact to uh, uh, tolerances, measurement uncertainty? Exactly, yes. Of course, if you have then an antenna which is at different uh, regions within the quiet zone, which actually have different deviations, then this directly impacts your TX or RX measurement. Okay. So the other parameter we are looking at is the amplitude and phase ripple. And this is more relating to the faster variations you may have in the quiet zone. So not like this deviation from, univer uh, from uniform, but more the local variations you can find. And these can be done to many parameters, including uh, reflections, uh, so interaction with the environment within the chamber, some scattering from the feed, some scattering from the uh, reflector itself, and those will create uh, yeah, those smaller variations. So usually we want to look at, for example, uh, ripple uh, in amplitude, for example, plus minus 0.5 dB. That's typical kind of quantity we look at. So, um, um, when I'm, I, we wanted to create this large quiet zone so that we are independent from that we need to know the antenna location, right? So, in those, uh, is that right? Did I understand that right? Yes, clearly. That's really the idea behind this black box approach, uh, which I think we want to continue discussing, that if you don't know a priori where your antenna is within your device, somehow you have to have the large quiet zone to encompass the whole device. Then you don't need to worry anymore that if your antenna is located here or there, your uncertainty will increase dramatically. So from that perspective, uh, Qatar is a solution that can be applied for conformance testing. Yes, clearly. In summary, one can say that we have to use a hardware-based approach like plane wave conversion or compact antenna test range to create a large enough quiet zone that offers far field conditions to execute both TX and RX measurements. Roland Schwartz offers both solutions tailored to certain measurement applications for 5G base station test or 5G device testing, including conformance testing for 5G and R. Thanks, Benoit, for the great insights. Um, I'm looking forward to continue our discussion in one of the next videos in this video series, Demystifying 5G, brought to you by Roland Schwartz.